Okay, well, hello everyone. My name is Allison Miller and I'm the founder and co-owner along with my husband of The Dissertation Coach. We are a company that is committed to supporting graduate students to earn uh, doctoral master's degrees. We also work with faculty and we have been in business this May for 20 years. So today's session is um, in a way a thank you to this incredible social media um, group of followers that we have on Facebook and Instagram and we really want to put out something for all of you to support you in having this new year and this new decade of 2020 be highly productive for you. Um, so I'm going to walk you through a whole variety of ways that you can approach and think about how you can be more productive, more engaged, more focused, better able to concentrate, better able to actually get words down on the page. So one way you can really think about getting a doctoral degree, a master's degree, whatever you're trying to accomplish, is that it's kind of like a whole series of bridge crossings. Now, when I talk today, I'm probably gonna mostly use the term dissertation, but if you're doing a thesis or some other kind of capstone or some other kind of project, please know that the word dissertation is a stand-in for whatever project you are doing. So the, um, think about it when you cross a bridge, right? Some bridges are like a cute little, quick little footbridge. Some of them are a four lane highway that are really busy with a lot of traffic and maybe a toll. Everything that you need to do between now and earning your degree is, it's really just a series of bridges you need to cross. There's a whole bunch of bridges around developing and designing a topic for your study. There are bridges that you need to cross um, that have to do with data collection or reading of developing your ideas of incorporating feedback. I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bridges that we need to cross. And what we want to do today here in this webinar is offer you a variety of strategies that you can use to be in a sense, a more effective bridge crosser. Eventually one day, you are going to cross a final bridge where you're going to submit your dissertation, your thesis to your university, and there's gonna be no more bridges to cross. And I know sometimes it can feel like that's a very long way away, or you can't imagine how you're ever gonna get there. There may be some of you on this webinar or listening to the recording later on who've actually thought about quitting, who felt hopeless, who've been really frustrated and wondered if there's any way to finish. And I want you to know if you have felt that way, you are definitely not alone. Over the last 20 years, I have spoken to thousands of students who really were on the verge of quitting. And we encouraged them not to do that. And they found a way to the finish line. And I've seen people overcome unbelievably challenging circumstances and issues and who now have their master's or doctoral degree. So I know that you can do it too. Okay, so I want to start by talking about something that we like to call the who, what, where, when, why, and how of productivity. And this is really designed for you to be, have a way to think about how to be a more productive bridge crosser. And we have a blog about this exact thing on our website. And when you get the email, the follow-up email to the session, the link to that blog will be in the email. So first of all, we want to think about who is going to do the work, like who's going to do the work. Now, I know you obviously know that you are in charge of actually doing your dissertation, that you are in charge of, um, of being the one who is going to show up each day and do the work each work session. But there's something really powerful about being in touch with the sense of, I'm going to do this work. And as strange as this may sound, I encourage you all to try this. In any given day, before you sit down to work, actually ask yourself that question. Who is going to do this work? And if you want, you can even type in the chat in all caps, I'm going to do this work, as if you're saying it to yourself. I am going to do this work. And you can hear when I say that, what I'm doing is I'm actually activating something in myself. I'm saying, I, Allison, I'm going to sit down and I am going to do this work. I'm going to be the person who's going to show up and I'm going to have courage 
And even though I am not feeling confident in my ability, I'm uncertain, this feels hard, I don't feel like it, I don't want to, you know what, so what? I am going to do this work. And I love seeing some of you are writing, I'm going to write my dissertation. I'm going to do this work. See, it's powerful. It makes a difference. It's, it's this way of recognizing that every single day we have to activate ourselves over and over and over again. You know, I have all kinds of projects that I'm working on where I resist. I don't feel like it. I don't want to. And I have a little pep talk with myself, you know, come on, Allison, let's go energize yourself. Let's move into it. That makes a huge difference if we recognize that we have uh, power, we have the capacity to wake ourselves up inside and to move our energy into what we're doing. All right, so the second piece of this is actually knowing what am I going to do. So a lot of times students will sit down to work with an instruction to themselves like, well, I'm going to work on my literature review. I'm going, I'm writing up my chapter five. I'm reading the literature, which is really kind of an instruction to do nothing or to procrastinate and watch Netflix or, you know, look through Facebook for two hours, be on the web, go get a snack. When we don't have a clear sense of what we're doing that's clear and specific and broken down, it's much easier to end up in an avoidance mode. So one of the key things that we need to do on a regular basis is get really clear about what am I specifically doing on a day-to-day -day basis and really narrow it down. So let me give you an example. Instead of saying I'm writing chapter two, my lit review, It'd be much better if you really took time to step back and outline that chapter two, brainstorm what are all the different sections that you're trying to write within a section, think through what are the key points that I want to communicate to the reader. And that prep work that you do is actually vital because then what you're able to do is take those smaller pieces and actually plan when you will do those. And we'll talk about when in a moment. So uh, one of the videos on our Facebook page is called Chopping Broccoli, and I'll just reiterate some of the messages in there. You know when you go to the grocery store and you buy a big, beautiful head of broccoli and you put it in that plastic bag in the supermarket and then you bring it home and you put it in a drawer in the refrigerator. And then maybe one or two weeks later, you open up that drawer, it smells, it's got like a weird growth on top of it. It's kind of slimy and you have to throw the broccoli away and you waste it your money and you never eat it. But if you come home from the grocery store and you chop that broccoli up into little pieces, put it in a nice container, the odds that you're going to eat it go way up. And so in many ways, when we talk about what in the who, what, where, when, why, and how of productivity, what is about being a broccoli chopper? Making sure that part of your daily life is stopping and stepping back and thinking about what are the specific smaller tasks that make up this larger thing called my dissertation. It's much easier to cross a bridge if it's got a beginning and end that are closer together. So this is about giving ourselves much smaller assignments. And if you feel challenged to do that, you feel like you just don't know how to break it up, then that means you need somebody else. You need another person who can help you figure out how to chop the broccoli. Someone who can help you think through what are the components that make up the dissertation. And by the way, really, what is a dissertation? It's fundamentally a series of learnable components. When we look at the dissertation as a whole, it is going to completely overwhelm us. We cannot figure out how we're possibly going to climb that mountain. So, what we need to do is break it up into smaller hills. We need a way to think about it where we can actually approach it. Now, some of the learnable components of the dissertation you do not know how to do yet. That's why you're a student. There's a learning process and that's okay. What, if you're working on something that you don't know how to do, well then it needs to get broken up in terms of what are the steps you can take to begin to learn how to do that, okay? so. Breaking things down in terms of what is going to give you a task list, which is so key because then it's easier to start to plan when you're going to do these, when you're going to do the what. Okay. 
Now, in addition to knowing who's going to do the work and what you're going to do, you want to think about where am I going to do it? Like, because oftentimes we try to work in environments that are not actually conducive for us to work. Personally, when I have writing projects, I need to get out of my house. I need to go to a coffee shop. Even though it's noisy and it seems like it'd be very distracting, I wrote a substantial part of my dissertation. Also the dissertation book that I wrote, I wrote most of it in traveling around coffee shops in Chicago. So if that works for you, great, go work in them. Some of you need to be in a place of complete silence. You need to be holed up in a library somewhere. Some of you, your home environment is actually quite good for you. So you wanna think about what are the environments in which you are the best at working? Where are you most focused? Where are you best able to concentrate? Also take a look around at the environment that you work in. If you work at home, it's really important that we actually have an environment that's conducive to working. If your desk is covered in paper, it's chaotic and messy, well, it's going to probably be a lot harder for you to concentrate and focus. I know many students say to us, well, I don't have time. I have too much work to do. I don't have time to clean up my office. But we would, at the dissertation coach, actually argue differently, which is that you don't have time not to make your work environment conducive. So really think about what you need to do in your work environment. Also, um, I think this is an aspect of um, where we work is limiting our access to this, the phone, to social media. So shut down your email. One of the things that I do with the phone is I go on and I set a timer for say 25, 30, 40 minutes. And I, I make a rule with myself. I'm not allowed to touch this until the timer goes off. So I run our social media accounts, Instagram and Facebook for the dissertation coach. And just to tell you the truth about myself, I find myself unconsciously opening up those apps. Ooh, let's see how well this post did. It's like I didn't even make a conscious decision to do it. So part of thinking about where am I working is also how am I managing the things in the environment around me that actually have the potential to distract me, where I'm like a zombie on my phone, right? So pay attention to where you're working. Is your environment conducive to you working? And maybe experiment and try different environments. Okay. Now we want to think about uh, when am I working? We actually need to know when am I working? Because we want to take this broccoli list, this, this list of specific items that we've come up with and think about when in reality am I going to do those things? A lot of times what will happen is we'll just put in our calendar for the evening, you know, a few tasks that we're going to accomplish, but we haven't thought through when we're going to have dinner. You know, if we have children, when are they going to realistically be asleep? Let's say that you work full time and you end work at five o'clock and then you imagine you write down in your calendar that between five and 8 PM, you're going to work on your dissertation. That's not actually true. We don't end work at five o'clock and then go right into the dissertation. So we want to start to really be honest about what are our zones. So one of the things that I do is I set aside specific zones of time um, in my calendar. That's like a zone from say two to 4 PM where I'm working on something. And I know that that period of time from 1.30 to two, I need to be winding down whatever else I'm doing. I need to have things set up for myself so that I'm ready to step into that time zone. And so we want to also think about protecting that time of the when am I working and setting boundaries, letting our, if we live with other people, letting them know this is my sacred time between you know, seven and 9 p.m. I am going to be focused and be in the zone and ask people to not interrupt us. So make sure you think about when in reality are you going to actually sit down and do what you have planned to do. It is important that we be somewhat conservative when we connect the what to the when. Um, many of us over plan and we manage our anxiety by imagining that we're going to do hours and hours of work in a time frame that really is not realistic for us. 
where we're compressing down. Oh yeah, I'm going to do all this work in two hours. I encourage our clients to actually be conservative. I would rather you slightly under plan what you're going to do in a particular time frame. You can always work ahead. Working ahead feels awesome, but con Constantly being behind what you planned you were going to do, that actually feels terrible and it's demoralizing. And it starts to really discourage you from feeling like you have any potency, any power to actually do what you say you're going to do. This who, what, where, when, why, and how is about empowering you to get across those bridges, to actually be able to say and declare, I'm going to do the following work at this time in this environment and start to have this feeling of power inside yourself that you're actually able to follow through and do what you say you're going to do. But that means we need to set ourselves up for success. Okay, let's talk about why. So important to be connected to, why am I doing this? Like, why am I in graduate school? What do I care about? How is this connected to my values, you know, to the, the deeper intentions I have for my life? Many of us actually are really concerned with problems that we see around the world, you know, and we want to be able to make a difference. We want to be able to improve the quality of people's lives. And sometimes when we get into the realm of academia and research, we can feel very removed for that and get disconnected from what we actually care about. Some of us are actually just intellectually curious people who we want to push our intellect to the limit. We want to explore ideas. We want to be able to teach. We want to be able to innovate, create, uh, do something that's meaningful and feel like we're leaving some kind of a legacy. Well, what you're doing today in the particular work zone, it's connected to that. So don't forget to stay in touch with why am I doing this? Sometimes Remembering why you're doing this can propel you across a bridge when you're feeling resistant, you know? So don't forget to stay connected to your values, to your deeper intentions, to an internal compass inside yourself. It's kind of like, what makes you tick? What, what inspires you? What makes your heart beat? What, what's, you know, what's your reason for being here and for doing this? Because you could have done a lot of other things, but here you are in graduate school seeking to earn a degree. For some of you, what you want to do in your career, you really do need to finish this degree. And that's a perfectly acceptable why. Some of you are just in this program because you like, you have a love of learning. You know, great. That's still a good reason. But we want to stay in touch with that why so we can get across those bridges. Okay, the last part of this is about how. How am I going to do this work? And this is about your attitude, your mindset, your approach to working. So for example, how I'm going to do this work is I'm going to really practice being devoted today. I like to think of it as you're going to come up with a word for the day. One of my favorites is devoted, which means that you're going to, I'm going to give all or a large part of my resources over to, to a particular task or endeavor. I'm going to really think about what is it, what would it be like today if I was fully devoted to exploring these ideas, to expressing myself in writing, not being perfect, you know, maybe not writing what ultimately is going to end up on the final document, but that I'm going to really work in a way where I'm expressing a sense of kind of loyalty or devotion to myself. This is the version of you that you're going to bring to the desk. You're going to bring to the computer. You're going to bring to the work session. Uh, one way I like to think of it is, um, you know, when you make, uh, if you're cooking and you make soup, and there's that moment where you take the spoon into the soup and you taste it and you go, hmm, what does this need? I think it needs some salt. Well, the how is where we tune into where we are in the present moment. Let's say I'm analyzing my data and I'm feeling a little stuck. I'm pausing and asking myself, what does this sort of data analysis soup need? What do I need right now? to forge ahead, to get across this bridge. What's going to help me? It's about tuning in again to really like an internal guidance system to a, a sense of wisdom and intuition about what you need to move forward and be productive. Given that you might not feel like working, given that it feels hard, given that it feels like you're struggling. So think about how are you gonna do it? I also wanna mention one thing about how. 
a lot of times what students are doing in their how is they're working ferociously. They're trying to force the work to happen. They're moving really, really, really quickly, too quickly. And what we notice in a lot of students is how they approach the dissertation is like a speed demon, like they're in an auto drive speed mode. It's like there's a truck running 100 miles an hour through our life and we say, yeah, I'm going to hook my rig to that. I'm going to go that fast, even though it's actually undermining our effectiveness. It's not supporting us and doing the quality of work. Um, one of the metaphors we use sometimes in our business is if you think about when you, let's say you were at a lake and you, there was a whole bunch of boats in the lake and there were these speed boats going really fast through the water. Well, if you've ever seen a speed boat going really fast through the water, it ends up actually skipping over the surface of the water. It skips things, it misses things. And so we notice that when students move too quickly, when how they approach the work is just trying to desperately get it done, is they actually end up skipping a lot of details. For example, they've gotten feedback from their advisor or committee and they're racing to address the feedback so quickly that they're not actually slowing down enough to really read and take in and digest what's being asked of them. We'd be so much better off moving through the water like a sailboat. You can still move deliberately. You can still move intentionally, right, at a good clip, but we don't want how we approach the work to speed up so much that we actually undermine ourselves, okay? All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about procrastination. I imagine, feel free to put in the chat if you struggle with procrastination. I would imagine that pretty much everybody who's here today has had challenges with procrastination. I procrastinate, um, everyone procrastinates. Do you know I wrote a book called Finish Your Dissertation Once and For All? And after I got the book contract, what do you think I did for the first six months? Nothing. I wrote nothing. I got so like, well, first of all, really caught up and busy. I had two young children at the time. Uh, my kids are uh, older now. And I, they were like, one of them was still a baby. And I was running a busy business. And I was also worried about like, could I really do it? You know, could I really write a book? What were people going to say on Amazon? <laughs> And so I did nothing for six months. So procrastination happens to us all. A lot of times students will say to us, gosh, I'm so lazy. What's wrong with me? I can't understand why I procrastinate so much. So I wanna pull back the veil a little bit and have us look underneath to see what's really going on when we're procrastinating. So first of all, it's really important to recognize it's not the work that we are avoiding. I know it seems like it is, but what we're actually avoiding is how we're thinking and feeling about the work. And when I say feelings, I don't just mean emotions. I mean, when we have thoughts and emotions, really what we experience is body sensations associated with those thoughts and feelings. So for example, if I'm worrying about my Amazon reviews, well, that creates a feeling of tightness and tension in my heart. If you're writing your dissertation as if your committee is reading over your shoulder while you're writing it, you're gonna naturally be tight and tense and have some maybe butterflies or not, not the happy kind in your stomach. You're gonna feel uncomfortable. It's gonna be physiologically unpleasant in your body. Well, human beings don't like pain. We're hardwired to move away from things that are uncomfortable and painful for us. So the reason that we procrastinate is because we're moving away from the dissertation, the thesis that's associated with the discomfort that we're experiencing with the uncomfortable thoughts, the doubt, the fear, the feeling like we're an imposter, the sense of inadequacy, the, uh, the shame, the irritation, the, even just sometimes the heaviness of like, I just don't feel like it. We're moving away from all of that. And so, to move away from those thoughts and feelings and body sensations, we have to move away with, from what we associate with those thoughts, feelings, and body sensations. So we move away from the work. So one of the key things we need to realize is that if we're gonna be truly productive in 2020 and ongoingly, we're gonna be able to be able to move across bridges effectively. We need to know that thoughts, feelings, and body sensations that are uncomfortable for us, they're going to show up. 
They will arise in our experience and they do not have to take charge of us. You could think a little bit like about this, like you're driving a car and you're trying to drive your car to a final destination called, I get my graduate degree. What happens when we're procrastinating is our thoughts, our emotions, and our body sensations kick us out of the driver's seat and they take over and drive the car for us. And pretty much they just drive us into a Netflix ditch, an email ditch, you know, whatever your ditches are, wherever you go, they drive us right off the road. We have to reclaim that seat and say, hey, thoughts, feelings, and body sensations, I see you, you know, welcome. I'm gonna have the courage to get in the driver's seat and drive anyway, even though I really, don't feel like it, I'm worried, I don't have what it takes. I just can't figure out what to say here, but I'm just gonna write some stuff and say it anyway. A big part of what we're trying to do um, in our practice is really support students to better align their behavior with how they want to feel down the road, not with how they happen to be feeling in the moment. So I hope that makes sense to you. So. Let's say, for example, you really want that feeling of um, the endorphins, the relaxation, um, the, the, the feeling that you moved your muscles, like you went and exercised. You would love to feel that great feeling you have after you exercise, except right now, when it's time to go to the gym or put on your running shoes and go out and run, you really don't feel like it, right? I'm sure most of us have had that experience. We have to find a way within ourselves to imagine how it's gonna feel at the end and align our behavior with that feeling we have after the run, after the workout, right? And in this case, after we've sat down and written. And I know some of your work sessions aren't gonna be that satisfactory. By the way, people who are runners, they have lousy runs. Sometimes when you go for a run, you just feel terrible the whole time. That doesn't mean you're not a runner. Some of your work sessions are not going to be satisfactory, but we want to press on. Um, someone who's been very influential in my life is a psychologist named Stephen Hayes, and he created a therapeutic approach called acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, and you probably can go on YouTube and look up some acceptance and commitment therapy videos. Personally, I love the book acceptance and commitment therapy for anxiety disorders. I think it's completely relevant for graduate students, even if you're not someone who feels like you're struggling with anxiety, because a lot of it is about how do we move forward and take action in alignment with our values, our goals, and our aspirations in the presence of internal content, meaning thoughts, feelings, sensations that are painful and uncomfortable for us. So one of the things Stephen Hayes talks about is the two kinds of pain that we experience as human beings. The first kind of pain is the pain of presence. The pain of presence is the inevitable pain that we all experience as human beings. You are not alone in feeling the pain that you have. If you're awake in the middle of the night really doubting why you went to graduate school, or really questioning if you can do this, feeling like an imposter, I promise you, you're in good company. If you just look at the feed on our Facebook or Instagram page and read the comments, you will feel much less alone. But the pain of presence is something that we're all going to experience, living in a human body. And a person who's trying to get a doctoral or master's degree, there's no way you're gonna get through that experience without experiencing the pain of presence. It's just part of the deal. What happens though, when we procrastinate, what we're fundamentally doing is we're engaging in something called experiential avoidance. We could just call it avoidance. Once we move into avoidance mode where we're avoiding feeling and thinking those thoughts and emotions and sensations, we create and invite another kind of pain into our life. And that is the pain um, that we have actually of absence. So the pain of absence is the pain of not doing what we said we were gonna do. The pain of not living in alignment with our values. The pain of feeling like we don't actually have control over ourselves. Right? By the way, I wanna say something about that. Absolute self-control is not possible. And we can be incredibly hard on ourselves, believing that we should be able to say we're gonna do something and do it. That's just simply not true. 
So it's not possible to have absolute control over yourself. However, it is possible to have more of an influence in your life where you're better able to do what you said you were going to do. And it's going to require that you allow the pain of presence to just be there. Think of it like, oh, look, you're a passenger in my car. You showed up. Welcome. I'm going to take you along with me for the ride while we work on this section, while we code this data, while we read these articles, while we try to digest the feedback that we're getting from the committee. You're welcome to join me on the journey, but I'm not going to allow you to stop me because that's going to invite kind of the searing pain of the pain of absence. So that is very demoralizing when we start to feel like we, we're not actually living up to our, our ideals. We're not actually able to do what's important and do what matters. At the end of a work session where you pushed through and you worked anyway, you were not going to care that you didn't feel like it. Now, I do want one say one important caveat to this, and that is that I'm not suggesting that you ignore your intuition and the internal signals that you actually need sometimes to get off the road and take a meaningful break. Sometimes we are been very stressed, we've been overworking, um, and we really do need time to decompress and step away from the work so we can collect ourselves. Um, many of you may have noticed that when you're struggling, let's say with some idea or concept, you're struggling with how to talk about your theoretical framework, that when you're not working on it, you're in the shower, you're walking down the street, you're having dinner, you're just about to doze off to sleep, all of a sudden you have like an epiphany, an idea, right? We do need downtime to be able to do good work. If you were an elite athlete, and I was your trainer, and I told you that I was going to have you work out 13, 14, 15 hours a day, and we weren't going to stretch, and we weren't going to ice, and we weren't going to rest, I, you would fire me. I would be a terrible trainer because my plan and approach would break down your body. So elite athletes know that rest, sleep, good food, stretching is vital to them being able to actually perform. And so this dissertation, this thesis for you, this is your Olympic event. So there's a difference between purposely taking time to regroup, to reconnect, to care for yourself, to be with friends and family, to kind of fill up your tank for the journey and finding yourself five hours into a Netflix binge or um, some of you may do this, I am guilty as charged. You wake up in the morning and what's the first thing you do? You roll over and you pick up your phone, right? And here we go. We open it up, you know, click, click, click. And now 45 minutes have gone by. And what have you done? You've just scrolled through social media, read some articles, checked your email. We have to be really careful that we don't end up in these kind of trances where we're avoiding our work. That's very different when we're actively avoiding our work. Now, here's one of the things that happens. When we continually avoid our work, then we never feel like we have the right to take care of ourselves. We feel too guilty to take time off. And so we don't take time off. We don't take real legitimate time off to care for ourselves and fill our tank so that when we go back to work, we're not restored. And so we, we struggle to really focus and concentrate and do the work. And there we are once again, in a, we get into the cycle where we're never really recharged and ready to go and so then we slide off into things that aren't really, we're like working, but not working. We're shuffling paper, we're checking your email. By the way, I did my dissertation before the invention of the iPhone. In fact, I did not have a cell phone when I was in graduate school, nor uh, did I even have an internet connection in my home until the last couple of years, and it was dial up. So we didn't even use it that often. I think that you are all, and there was obviously no streaming services. We were still using a VCR. So I think all of you are much more challenged than I was when I was in graduate school. We've got to set boundaries with these. A lot of us are compulsively constantly checking our text messages, our social media accounts. Um, we're doing this thing of, okay, one more episode. Okay, just one more episode, one more episode. 
we have to set boundaries with these, with these devices. Um, what's happening to us is that we're not getting enough time to deeply engage with our work and it's making us think that we're not smart. But actually, it's because we're in a constant state of interruption where we're not getting an opportunity to push ourselves to our intellectual limit, to stretch and grow. If, uh, if again, let's go back to me being your trainer. Let's say we went to the gym together and I had you pick up some dumbbells and you did five reps and I, that, that would not build your biceps, right? We, just like you to build biceps, you need to really work them out and break down the muscle so that it comes back stronger. Our brain is kind of similar. We need to push ourselves in a given work session to our intellectual limit, then take a break and step away. Over time, that's how we actually get smarter. That's how we build new pathways, develop new skills and abilities. If you're relating to graduate school, like I either have the ability now or I don't, and if I don't have it, there's nothing I can do about it, you are very misinformed. You can get smarter than you are today. What you need to do to, to, to earn this degree much of it you still have to learn. So we need distraction-free time to dive deeply and hang in there and be willing to not know. If you're struggling, that's not an indication that you're not smart enough or that you shouldn't be in the program or that you're a fraud or they shouldn't have admitted you. It means you're on the verge of learning to be, learning is about to take place. You're setting the stage to actually be able to learn by um, pushing yourself to your intellectual limit. I'm moving because I'm sitting in a way where my foot fell asleep. That's not a pleasant feeling. So really give yourself that chance, those zones of time. So who, what, where, when, why, and how. Creating a context where we're gonna concentrate, we're gonna focus, we're really gonna dive in deeply and push ourselves to our intellectual limit. Okay, so in the rest of our time together, we have about 23 minutes. I want to walk you through a variety of strategies and approaches that we use with our clients in our practice to support them to be as productive as possible on an ongoing basis. The first one is, I think, one. I'm just going to mention it briefly because we have a blog on our website about it, and I believe many of you already know about it. This is about the Pomodoro technique. Pomodoro is Italian for tomato. Why they call it tomatoes, I do not know. But there's a website, uh, mytomatoes.com, and, and the information on that will be in, a, in the email that you get after this, the link to this blog, which has the link to the website. This is where you work um, in 25-minute increments. Why this is effective, it's a bit of a mystery to me, but I have written pages and pages of material using the Pomodoro technique. So basically, in a nutshell, it's where you practice picking a focus, it's the what, what am I working on? And you're going to work on it for 25 minutes. You're giving yourself a 25 minute tunnel. We're not checking our email, we're not having conversations, we're not making a snack, we're not going off on the internet. I'm only working on drafting this little tiny narrow section. I may not complete it, that's okay. But the idea here is I'm focusing and we're using the tomatoes as kind of a self-awareness tool so that we can begin to be aware of what thoughts, emotions, and sensations arise inside that 25 minute window that threaten to derail us. And can we take a deep breath, observe and notice them, thank them for arriving and ask them to have a seat. You're gonna keep working until the buzzer goes off at the end of the 25 minutes. So check out that blog when we send you the link in the follow-up email. And if you haven't been using the Pomodoro technique, we strongly encourage you to try it. It can really create a context in which you can be much more effective. What some of our clients do is they get onto like a Skype call uh, with a buddy and um, they practice working in 25 minute increments together where you mute yourself in between the 25 minutes, you get a five minute break in between tomatoes, you come back in on Skype or you know, WhatsApp or whatever you're using, you come back into the meeting, you both declare in that five minute break uh, what you're going to do next. You can talk about how it went in the last tomato, what you learned from it, and what you wanna to try to do in the next tomato. One of our wonderful clients, she came up with this name that um, if you just cannot get yourself to do a full tomato of work, then set your timer on your phone for five, 10, 15 minutes and call it a cherry tomato. See if you can just 
get yourself warmed up a little bit into the work. Many of our clients um, use this term, they call it a clover, like a four leaf clover. Their goal is to do four tomatoes in a row. Then they take a longer break. So many people will try to do uh, two clovers in a day. Now, if you work full time, it can be really helpful to set a goal that you're gonna do at least one tomato a day. Why does that matter? When days and days and days go by where you haven't made contact with your dissertation, it gets a lot harder to get back into it. So making a little bit of content, contact, excuse me, with your dissertation on a regular basis makes it more likely that when you have more time, say on the weekend, that you'll be able to get into it. Even if all you do is reread something that you wrote before, that can keep things warmed up for you, easier to cross back over into the work. Okay. Um, I've already alluded to this a little bit, but something that can make a huge difference, it's one of the functions that we play here at our company, is find some kind of accountability. One of the challenges that students have is that no one knows if you work today or not. You know, most faculty advisors are not actually holding students accountable. Now, I know there is an ultimate accountability that at some point, if you do not do what you're supposed to do, you, you won't be able to get your degree, but there isn't accountability today or tomorrow or this week. So see if you can find someone in your life who's actually going to hold you accountable. Personally, I would not recommend that it be your spouse or significant other. That's, you know, having a long-term committed relationship is challenging enough without asking that person to hold you accountable. See if you can find a peer or a friend uh, who can actually, and maybe you can work together in a way where you're supporting and holding each other accountable. Another key thing that's really important to be a more effective bridge crosser is to temporarily lower our standards for the quality of work, quality and quantity, I would say, that we can accomplish in a given time frame. And oftentimes we are writing as if our committee's reading it. We're writing with a standard for the quality and quantity of work that is too high and we're making it impossible for us to move forward. We really need to learn how to lower our standards. The only way that I can really ever get any writing to done is to write really, really rough drafts. Some of you may know um, Anne Lamott wrote this great book called Bird by Bird and she calls it a shitty first draft. So one of our clients years ago said, you know, I'm really tired of calling my work shit and crap. I'm gonna call it a baby draft. And we love that term around here. When you're planning what you're going to do and when you're going to do it, if it's the first time you've ever written it, let go of any idea it's gonna be perfect. It is not. Call it out, say, I'm going to write a baby draft of this little tiny section, just a baby draft. That's all I need. I don't, then I'll come back at a later time and that baby draft will start to stand up and walk, right? Another way to think about it is go ahead and write the elementary school version. Then you're gonna write the junior or middle school version, then the high school version. Then it can start to become college and graduate level over time. It would be wonderful. I know we have this fantasy that we're just gonna sit down over the weekend and we're gonna write an entire lit review and it's gonna be fantastic because you remember that when you were taking classes, you waited till the last minute to write a paper the truth is that paper was not very good and it was being read in comparison to other papers that were read that were written the weekend before they were due. So we really wanna lower our standards in the service of our productivity, in the service of our learning. I know that perfectionism is, is a challenge many students face and it can be hard to let go of that, but we need to practice. And one key way you can practice is by setting aside time where you're just actually practicing writing with a lower standard. It will be uncomfortable, but after a while, you're going to start to see that it really serves you. You also want to watch out for magical thinking, okay? Magical thinking is what, in a way, what I've already been talking about. I'm going to write a lit review this weekend. No, you're not. Where we imagine that we can do far more work than we can possibly do. And yeah, does it make you feel better temporarily? when you come up with this magical plan, but pretty soon 
it kind of betrays you and makes you feel lousy because there was no way that you could live up to what you thought you were going to do. Right. So a lot of times we'll say, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to meet up with my family and then I'm going to do this and that, and then I'm going to work. And we have like 300 things planned for the day. And it really is magical thinking. So it's really important that we come into reality and start to be honest about what we can humanly accomplish in a given day. We also need to be able to really prioritize our dissertation. The truth is, is that you're going to have to make some sacrifices, most likely. You may not be able to go to all the family events or parties. You may need to hire more childcare. You may need to have some loving, direct, kind conversations with the people who live in your home about what you're needing to actually finish. And so this is part of really knowing how are you going to do this is what do you need from other people and from yourself to make this happen? What are some of the boundaries that you need to set? Um, and this might be uncomfortable to do this, but we need to do it. We need to really um, set ourselves up so that there really is uh, uninterrupted time scheduled for ourselves to be able to do this. Um, also, I wanna talk about something that's I think is so vital for us is we need to support ourselves to make better transitions. That it's very challenging when you've been working on, you know, maybe you're raising a family, you're working full time in a job, whatever you else you are, your roles and responsibilities in your life. And now it's time to work on your dissertation. And you imagined that you were going to start working at 7 p.m. And now all of a sudden it's 7:30 p.m. It's 8 p.m. And what happened? Well, what happened is we didn't make the transition from whatever else we were doing into the work. And we're struggling to make that transition. A lot like we just don't feel like getting on the treadmill we, or we don't feel like getting out the door and running. We don't feel like starting something. You know, I have this aspiration that I, my life works so much better when I start my day with this smoothie that I make that's just vegetables and fruit. It's like bright green. It's got frozen mango and bananas in it. And I actually love it. However, it's the weirdest thing. I don't feel like getting out the blender and chopping up the vegetables and I resist doing it. So even though it makes me feel great, I feel like I'm much more healthy and vibrant and it just like makes my day flow. Yet every morning, there's still that resistance that's there. So we can think of resistance as something that's just going to show up. It's like, it's going to climb into your car. It's not a problem. It doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean you're lazy. It just means you're experiencing resistance. And that resistance gets in the way of transitioning our energy from wherever it is into doing what we plan to do or what we need to do. So one key way that we can support ourselves to make transitions is to actually have obviously the environment set up where what we're working is, is out and ready to go. If your plan was to do some deep dive and reading some articles, have those articles already sitting out on your desk, neatly organized, or have them in your backpack or your bag ready to go. Have the file open on your computer ready to go. Um, when you're writing and your session's over, but you're midstream and in, in working on something, leave a trail of breadcrumbs for yourself. Leave some notes for yourself describing where were you at in your thinking process? Where do you want to pick up? Because when you do that, it makes it much easier for you to kind of pick up that thread again. So think about what you need. So I, we encourage our clients to do the following. Get set up the night before. I actually, to be honest with you, I do this seven days a week. So I have you know, a lot going on in my life, a lot of roles and responsibilities. And I keep a yellow pad of paper uh, at my desk and even though I have my calendar planned in Outlook, I still write out the flow and trajectory of the day where what I'm doing is I'm designing my day. I'm creating a vision for how I want the day to flow and unfold. And if I have projects that involve writing where I'm naturally going to resist them, I don't ever plan that a call is going to end at 1 p.m. and then I'm writing at 1 p.m. That doesn't work. 
So I will actually plan a 15, 20, 30 minute period where I'm just warming up to the work. I'm brainstorming, I'm thinking about ideas, I'm reading something. That's just what works for me. But we do want to think about how we can make a vision for the day that's gonna help us better transition into those zones of time, the when, so that we're gonna be more likely to cross that little bridge that we planned, okay? Um, I think it's also helpful to, um, if, you're, if you're not gonna be working at home, get all your stuff ready and organized in your bag. Um, get your snacks ready. You know, think about what you need. Lay your outfit, you know, go ahead. You can lay that outfit out of what you're gonna wear the next day. Just kind of like, if you're someone who's in, who works out early in the morning, if you get your gym clothes out and your sneakers out, it just takes the edge off a little bit. We wanna park the car on a downhill slope so it's easier to transition into the work. Another thing is it's really helpful to actually acknowledge and say even out loud to yourself, Allison, you're transitioning right now. And there's some resistance here. Okay, can we do it? Can we move forward? Can we get into it? You're kind of having a, like you're like an inner coach. Okay, come on, it's okay. This is hard, I know, but you can do this. Let's, let's move. You're waking up something inside yourself that's encouraging you, that's telling you to move forward, to dive in there, you know, to get going. Um, and then to have kind of a visualization of the day in your mind. But, you know, you, but that, I find that to be incredibly helpful because I have a pretty good sense of what I'm going to avoid and resist. And so I have a visualization of myself already doing it. Kind of like I imagine that people who um, compete in the Olympics, let's say they were um, going to run a race. Um, I imagine that they would visualize that race ahead of time. They're creating like a mental script of how they're going to perform the next day. Remember, your dissertation is your Olympics, and we need to support ourselves in this way on a day-to-day -day basis if we want to be uh, effective, okay? All right, another thing that I think is really important is that we um, really own the dissertation process, that we really have a great sense of, this is my dissertation, and I'm actually in charge of it. We notice a lot of students, in a way, aren't really owning it. They have a lot of fear. They're having a, you know, actually they're not really acknowledging and accepting that they're actually doing a dissertation. It's almost as if they wish they could outsource it to someone else. I mean, not literally, but they're not really fully taking responsibility. Here's one of the ways that we see that. We'll see students who get critical feedback and they revise it and then we look at it and we can see they didn't actually take in and digest the feedback that was given to them. That to us tells us they're not really owning the dissertation process. They're not diving deeply into really understanding the moving pieces. And that's understandable because a lot of times when we feel like we don't understand something, when something's difficult or hard for us, there's a fear that we're not capable of learning what we need to learn. So it can feel like, well, I'll just keep a dissertation kind of at an arm's distance, even though obviously this isn't rational and it isn't going to work out for you. But we have to embrace the entire dissertation, including the parts that are hard for us. If you struggle, let's say you struggle with statistics. That's me. I'm much more of a qualitative researcher. Stats do not come easily and naturally to me. But that does not mean that I should indict my entire being and just write myself off as not smart enough. What's actually more accurate to say is that there are aspects of research that come more naturally to me and that are some that require more thought, more engagement, looking at it from different angles. I actually need more support and guidance around statistics than you may, right? But that's okay. It doesn't mean I'm not capable of learning. It, you don't need to have a natural genius for doing this work to actually become quite capable and skilled. But what you do need is effort. We need to be willing to really dig in there and put in the effort, write baby drafts, make a mess, struggle, get feedback, revise again, fall off the horse, get back on, try again. That's how we learn and grow. And that's what this process fundamentally of graduate, getting a graduate degree is designed to do for us. 
Now, the last thing I want to talk about is something that's so near and dear to our heart at the Dissertation Coach is about compassion. Graduate students, and I think all human beings, can be so hard on themselves. For example, believing that absolute self-control is possible when it isn't. Believing that the way that you motivate yourself is by criticizing yourself. Many of us were raised by parents or we had teachers and people of authority around us who sought to motivate us by criticizing. They criticized us. Clean up your room. What's wrong with you? You know, God, why can't you get better grades like your sister? So what happened to many of us growing up is that motivation and criticism kept getting paired together. And so we come to believe that the way that you motivate yourself is by being hard on yourself, by criticizing yourself. Well, I think it's important that we step back and we ask ourselves, is that actually working for me? I often joke with our clients that if self-criticism was an effective tool for motivation, our business would not exist. Right? There wouldn't be a multi-billion dollar diet industry because people would just criticize themselves into losing weight. Self-criticism is an, actually an incredibly demoralizing and ineffective tool to support yourself to do what you need to do to finish graduate school. And rather what we need instead is to awaken a deep sense of care and compassion for the fact that this is hard. This is a struggle. We can feel overwhelmed. We can be brought to our knees and feel incredibly incompetent. We feel like we're an imposter. We don't feel like we know what we're doing and we really need to be kind. So in those moments when here you are, you've said what you're gonna do, when you're gonna do it, where you're gonna do it, why you're gonna do it, how you're gonna do it, you've thought that through. Wouldn't it be great if you showed up with a, hey, I know this feels hard. I know, you know what? It's all right. It's totally normal to feel this way. It's okay. Let's take a step. Can we take one step? Can we just take one step? I really encourage and invite all of you to try waking up a kinder, more benevolent voice inside yourself to support yourself and encourage yourself to, uh, to get there, okay? It's so challenging to try to get there with self-criticism. And I know that's a habit that's hard to break, but it also will feed your perfectionism if you're criticizing yourself. There's a wonderful uh, a academic named Kristen Neff. Her last name is spelled N, N as in Nancy, E-F-F. -F. So if you look up Kristen Neff on YouTube, you can watch some of her brilliant talks on self-compassion. She wrote a beautiful book called Self-Compassion that I highly recommend reading. I think it is vital uh, really for all human beings on the planet. I think that if everybody was waking up and being more compassionate towards themselves, um, not only would we be able to be more productive and do what we want, but we would live in a more peaceful planet. Okay, so thank you for listening to me go on and on here for an hour. Just so wonderful to have so many of you here and I see all the chatting that you've done. I really appreciate it. Um, what I would um, say is, Watch this video again when you can. Think about how you can implement these strategies and reach out to us. If you feel like you could use coaching or consulting support to help you get through the process, uh, we will be happy to reach out to you. It'll either be myself or Rowena Robles on our team who will contact you. And if you're not following us on Facebook or Instagram, we encourage you to do so. And I wanna thank all of you who do. We, we just adore our Facebook and Instagram community. If you bring us, um, a lot of joy. And as you go forward, remember what you need to be productive in 2020, what you need to cross those bridges and to ultimately get your degree. I'm telling you, it's within you. You just need to tap into it, right? And if you have a bad work session, you have a bad week, you have a bad month, that doesn't matter. Most of the people walking around on the planet who have graduate degrees had bad days bad weeks, bad months, and even bad years. And yet somehow they still found a way to finish. I'm incredibly optimistic that each and every one of you here watching this video can find a way to be 
productive, to move forward, and ultimately to get your degree. All right, thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate you being here on this webinar.